Today we're going to continue with our series that we've started. And what has been really neat is, one of the things that's been really neat is that during the men's retreat, this phrase, being religious or being a disciple, showed up several times in the mouths of several different men. That this idea is resonating, I believe. This is revolutionary, perhaps. This is a, a change, maybe, in the direction of the Lord's church, not just here, but trying to get it from here to other places and other congregations and other brothers and sisters in Christ and other people that we know and love who love Jesus, but they love Jesus outside of where the truth lies. And so this church, I think, idea of trying to get out of this being religious thing and in to then being disciples of Christ will change not only your life, but the lives of people around you. That I have been so impressed with watching people work through this, this, this concept and starting to realize that their faith has been a faith of religious tone far more than it has been of a disciple tone. And so I'm hoping that as you're going through this series with me, it is changing your life and resonating within you as well. We've tried to look at the different forms of religion and the different types of being religious by looking at a multiplicity of, of um, sections of Scripture. And we, we camped on Matthew chapter 19 where we talked about the, oh, that rich young ruler and how he was religious. He was a church member. and He believed in the truth, and the truth was there. He believed in the Ten Commandments and the Word of God. He went to a place and had the type of religion that was founded upon truth. But this rich guy said, you know what, Jesus, there's still something missing. And I believe that that is true for so many folks in the Lord's church that they have been bound into and by the truth of God's Word. And you believe in that, but you have turned that form of belief in just certain doctrine into a religious practice of keeping certain doctrines, and you're missing the rest of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And because of that, your heart is empty. Your, your work perhaps feels empty. Your worship feels empty because you've been doing it unbeknownst to you from a religious practice only and not a discipleship practice included. And so we noticed his struggles as he is the rich young ruler. And then we went to Luke chapter 14 and made a transition from this concept of being religious to the concept of being a disciple. And what it really takes to be a disciple of Jesus. So we put up some pie charts and I tried to show you this, this, being a disciple of Christ is, is formulated in three basic areas. Truth, heart, and service. If you really want to be a disciple for Christ, you have to have all three of these working together. Unfortunately, we know of far too many people that have two out of the three and feel or believe that they are then being a part of a disciple or a religion that's connected to Christ when they're still missing something. For example, those that we know who today perhaps are worshiping in the buildings that they have, using the name of Jesus and the Bible open, and you know, picking and choosing certain verses, but they're not teaching the truth and the whole truth. And yet these people have such a heart and a passion for Christ, they go out and they shout from the corners the name of Jesus to come and repent and believe on Him and just pray this prayer and He's yours. And they go out into the streets and they serve with great passion trying to meet the needs of the people who are in need. And of that, boy, that's a good thing too. But within this, this whirlwind of emotion and heart and service, they lack the truth. And because they lack the truth, the whole truth, they are not disciples of Jesus. They've been deceived into thinking it, into feeling it, but they're not. And then you can go to that next area where we have folks who know the truth. And they go out and they do bits and pieces of service. But they almost feel as if they're obligated like a work to do it. 
And not from the heart to do it. Not with passion for Christ trying to, through this service and through the truth, lead people into a relationship with Jesus. And because of that, even people who have these two sections are not disciples of Christ. Because they lack the heart. And so for what we're doing now is taking these three pieces of the pie and over these next three weeks, maybe the next three weeks, we'll get through one section each week to show how important each one is. But brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know, and if you take nothing with you other than this, then it will almost be enough. Everything begins with truth. Everything begins with truth. Truth leads to heart. Truth and heart lead to service. These things cannot happen. Having a heart and a passion for Jesus Christ and a love for Him cannot happen without truth. Having the heart for Christ and a love for Jesus and a service for Him cannot happen without truth. Truth is the foundation where everything begins. How do we know? How do we know what and who God is? How do we know who we are? How do we know what we are? How do we know who Jesus is? How do we get to heaven? When it comes to knowing God and Jesus and faith and the roles of men and women and salvation and all these things, how do we know what they are without an absolute standard of truth? Folks, this is where I, I try to say this as many times as I have a chance to. What I like to do when we get into situations, get into discussions, get into to thoughts or feelings or, or, or ideas or dreams or situations or struggles or problems, what I like to do is I like to try to go back and trace everything back to a very beginning place, to a foundation that we know we're going to find the answers from if we build on this. Far too many people chase far too many rabbits because they're trying to find the answers within the situation when what they need to do is trace it all the way back to the truth. Whatever that is. In whatever situation you're in. It needs to be traced back to the truth. Here's the challenge. What is truth? This is a question that was asked many years ago by a man by the name of Pilate. He was there with Jesus. And he was with Jesus, and Jesus is trying to tell him, listen, I'm the truth. And, and, and Pilate responds, well, then what is truth? And that's the question that so many people are asking today, and they're answering it in places and with answers from places that really aren't truth at all. In our society today, it has been taught that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and whatever it is, even if it is standing in contrast of each other, both can be true at the same time. And brothers and sisters, that's a lie. You cannot have two things in opposition of one another be both true. That is an oxymoron. And there are far too many morons out there. Because they believe, and I mean no disrespect, I've been a moron, all right? I've been in a place in my life many times, far too many times, where I've believed in a truth that I've created in my own world with my own life, and I've believed it to be true, and how dare you tell me I'm not right. I've been that. I've been the moron. But the only way to break out of that is to have myself and have everybody just step back for a moment and go, just now, wait a second. Don't you see that there are two opposing things and just logic says both can't be true at the same time so either one of us is right with truth or we're both wrong those are the only two options if there is an absolute standard of truth this one's not on the slides i'm going to go toss this one out for free if you turn to the book of Romans chapter 1, you're going to find this progression, or this digression, if you will, of, of mankind and how mankind takes the truth, takes the truth from God, written on their hearts, 
Jesus is King. The Lord is there. He's the Creator. Takes these truths, and what they do is they digress into a place where they create their own truth. And the Scripture says that they exchange the truth for a lie. Here's another section for free, really quickly. Mark chapter 7. Read it for yourself, starting in verse 1, where Jesus is dealing with people who have decided to take these religious traditions and they've been teaching them for so long, saying them over and over again, that those traditions then had turned into truth for people, including the folks teaching them. And they were claiming that they were from the Word of God, founded upon the Word of God, and they were teaching these things, and the followers were following the teachers teaching these traditions that has now become truth. Well, Jesus shows up and he says, now, hey, wait a second, guys, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you on these traditions that you're teaching, and I'm going to hold up the real truth in reflection to your teaching, and I'm going to show you that what you teach as a tradition stands in contrast to the absolute truth from God and his word. Now what are you going to do about it? Because there are far too many people who are teaching far too many things that are religious traditions that have been founded upon men. They've turned it into truth, saying that it comes from God's word. And what they have done is they've exchanged the truth for a lie. Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? Then you have to be willing to break out of traditions in your life that you have turned into truths. You have to be willing to break out of family traditions that you've turned into a way of life. You have to be willing to look to God's truth and hold that up as the standard by which you and I are called to live and be willing to say, yes, no more am I going to be this self-guided tour through life. No more am I going to make decisions that are sort of quasi-religious. I'm going to label it with Jesus and I'm going to feel my way through it. And then when I get to the other side, I'm still going to be empty. Because what I've done is I've exchanged the truth for my own way of religion and discipleship. And then on that day, like we read the last week, Lord, Lord, what do you mean? You don't know who I am. I went to the Sunset Church of Christ. Man. I was even baptized in that church building. Man, Lord, I was there out of 52 weeks, 36. And on Wednesday nights, I made some. But don't you know, I did so many things for you. And he'll say, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Why? Because you exchanged the truth for a lie. And you came up with your own truth, in your own religion, in your own view of who I am. You just didn't follow who I am. Folks, everything is built upon truth. What is truth? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. What did he do? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. And what did he do? He dwelt among us. And what did he do? And he beheld the glory, the glory of his Father, as of the only begotten one of the Father, full of grace and truth. Church, this is where it begins. What is truth? Truth is God. God himself is truth. So much so that he said, listen, I know you can't see me in heaven because I'm spirit and I can't be seen with human eyes. So what I need to do is come up with a way not only to save you, but to show you truth. We needed to understand the mind of God. And last time I checked, you and I cannot see into the minds of people. But we have a view of who and what the mind of the people are through what they say and what they do. It's the only way that we can climb into the mind of somebody simply by them revealing who they are by what they say and what they do. God knows this. 
So he says, I'll show you. I'll send me to you. And I'll be called the Word. The living mind of God revealed to mankind by what Jesus says and what he does. You want to know truth? His name is Jesus. Period. That's what we see in the beginning. Then we turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, what is truth? Truth is Jesus. What did Jesus do? He shows us the mind of God by what he says and what he does so we can know truth. John chapter 3. I'd imagine most of us can quote this verse. For God so loved the world that he did what? Sure he did. And then what's that? What's that? What else? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have... And it's almost as if John chapter 3 ends there. Isn't it? I mean, that's where people stop. Oh man, that's it. John chapter 3. What's John chapter 3? Just one verse. 16. What happened to verses 1 through 15? Well, I don't know them. What about verse 17? Is there a verse 17? Well, yes, I think, maybe. Well, what does the rest of it say? And by the way, let me just give you a little quick hint. When somebody just says to you, hey, listen, you know, it's all about John 3, 16. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him. See, all it takes is belief. My question to them is, how do you know what to believe in? How do you know what to believe in? I mean, isn't that a, a, a logical question? You have to have some sort of information to then be revealed to you so that you have then something to decide whether you believe in that or not. I'll give you a quick one. Tad Masteller is really handsome. Only my wife said amen. Amen. But you see, that was something that was revealed, and then you have to decide based upon other factors, is that true or not? And if it is true, is it true enough to apply to my life? Not just apply to my life, but how much of my life do I want to apply to that truth that I know to be true? And then if it's something that you really believe in and you have passion for, and you're willing to give your life towards it, then it's something that you really believe in. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him, how do you know who He is? How do you know who he really is? I'll give you another one. Isn't it amazing how many times we pass our opinion on about somebody that we really don't know? So we do the same thing. We do the same thing with people. Well, have you heard? I really don't like that guy. Have you ever met him? No. Then how do you know who he is? You know, I think we do that far too many times toward people even in the church where we pass these assumptions on as to how little they do or how weak they are in the faith, but yet we really don't spend time enough with them to find out where their faith is. So we start to believe in things that really aren't true, but we've heard whispers of things that we then buy into, form our opinion, and then our opinion becomes truth. And don't you tell me anything else. We do that with Jesus all the time. People do that with Jesus all the time. They hear a little whisper here, a little talk here, a little praise Jesus there, and before you know it, they form for themselves this Christ that they believe in. And man, He becomes their God. But do you really know who He is? Yes. Based upon what? Things I've heard. But is it based upon truth? I think people would be shocked to find out who Jesus really is if they found out what he really says and reveals about who he really is. Matter of fact, I think many people in the Lord's church would be shocked to find out who exactly he is if they spent time really trying to find out who he is. And I understand that one of the main things about really becoming a disciple is that you got to have him to believe in. But based upon truth based upon your own personal investigation, not just things that you've heard. So verse 17 then, 
For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the dark world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Watch us now, verse 21. But he who does the... Say it. Yes. He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in or through God. Now, how in the world am I going to believe in God without truth? And he says, how in the world am I going to live in the light without truth? And I think he's talking to people who are religious of the day. And yet he calls them evil and living in darkness. You want to know why he can say that? Because he knows that their life doesn't match the truth. Well, there's another one. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. If you haven't opened your Bibles, I'd highly suggest doing it. We're going to spend most of our time in the book of John. And we're going to go fast. John chapter 4. Unless it's going to be a six, seven part series. John chapter 4, starting in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do. What? What's he say? You worship what you don't know. We know what we worship. How do you know? What you worship unless you know what you worship based upon what you know to be truth. Truth must be revealed for us to know it in a way that we can know it so we can worship Him, so we can know Jesus, so we can believe in Him and have everlasting life. God is not a dumb God. He's a really smart God. He's smart enough to know that what we need is from Him, somehow from heaven to this earth, to have truth revealed in a way, His truth only, in a way that we can read it, study it, know it, believe it, decide what we're going to do with it, hopefully love Jesus, give our heart to Him, and then because of that become disciples. And now we are going to be servants in the kingdom, leading others to the King, because we know the truth, we have heart for the truth, and we are servants of the truth. But it all starts with truth. I, 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 don't, I don't like saying phrases like this because I know it comes across sometimes harsh. But it is the truth. Ignorance kills. Ignorance kills marriages. Ignorance kills relationships between parents and children. Ignorance kills children versus children. Ignorance kills cultures and societies one against the other. And ignorance kills people for eternity because they don't know God. Ignorance kills. And that is the truth. So, verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is when the, say it, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in, there it is again, truth, for the Father is seeking such. God is looking. He's looking. God right now, in His infinite power, in His infinite glory, He's looking for people to worship Him. He's on the move right now in this room. And He's looking in places that we can't see with our eyes, but He most assuredly can. And He's looking right now in the Sunset Church of Christ, in the pews and in the pulpit, who's really worshiping Me? Who's really in it? Who's really lifting Me up? Who knows that they're worshiping Me in truth and spirit? Verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship Him must. There's the condition. Worship in spirit and in truth. God does not accept ignorant worship. 
He wants people to know who He is and make the decision based upon truth to worship who He is because you really know Him. But to do that, God had to give us the truth. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 31. Jesus speaks, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was a burning, shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself who sent me has testified by his voice. Wow. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe you search the what scriptures well why search them because the scripture is what god has delivered to us as our version and our ability to see his truth and Jesus finishes up this section with letting them know that this book, this word, it was the Old Testament at the time he was referring to, is in fact the very truth that testifies that he is the Messiah because all they need to do is take this book, open it up, hold the life of Jesus in front, and say, now, does that guy match this image revealed in truth? We know that this is truth because it comes from God. God breathed. Here it is. Scripture. We know it comes from God. And this guy claims to be the Messiah. Is he? How do we know? It's my opinion that he is. It's my opinion that he isn't. I don't care what your opinion is. What does the book say? What does the truth say? John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you... Please read this with me. John chapter 8, verse 31. The, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you... Say it, church. If you abide in my, then you are. Which means that Jesus had to reveal not just to them who walked by his side, but to those of us today because he calls us to be disciples. He needed to figure out how to get his word to us in 2015 so that we can know his word so that we can be disciples of his so we can know His truth and be disciples of His. So we can know what He says, so we can be the parents, we can be the husbands and the wives and the servants. We can worship Him then in the way that He calls to be worshipped by knowing His truth. Verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, well, we are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the, uh, what I have seen with my father, and you do not uh, do what, my father, what you have seen with your father. They answered and said, Abraham is our father, Jesus said to them. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth which I heard from God, Abraham 
did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come from myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. How do you know when somebody's not of God? When they don't hear, listen, and follow the truth. Folks, I know I've got to speed up. I've got a whole many, a lot more slides here. John chapter 10, very quickly, verse 1. John 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter into the sheep fold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and, and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by his name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Listen. Jesus knows that his sheep knows his voice. And that means that we have to have a way of seeing it. Very quickly, John chapter 14, 6 and 16 through 17. Jesus talks to the apostles and says, I'm sending you, I'm sending you the helper, the Holy Spirit. He's going to be the spirit of truth. He's going to lead you, my apostles, that I authorize in the truth. So when I go to heaven, you guys are going to then bear witness with truth, have the truth come into you, and you're going to document the truth so that other people know the truth, and the truth will set them free. John chapter 15, in the next slide, and chapter 16 says the same thing. In John chapter 17, Jesus Christ himself then is praying on your behalf that guess what? We're all going to be one with him through what? Through the Word being spoken and written and preached. John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. He clearly says that if you love me, you will do what? Keep whose commandments? Keep whose commandments? His commandments. Not preacher, pastor, parent. Not neighbor, not president, not councilman. That you will keep His commandments, which means that He must have then revealed them in a way that we can have them in 2015 and see them so that we can follow them and love Him. The next slide in in, uh, John chapter 15, verses 10 and 14, says the same things, same things. 2 Peter chapter 1, man, I'm hurrying. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 20. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke of God. That what we have in the Scriptures is from God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 16. 2 Timothy clearly says that God's Word, that the Scriptures are God-breathed. And we have references in the Bible that what Paul wrote were, in fact, Scriptures. What Paul wrote was God-breathed. What these prophets wrote in the Bible was God-breathed. We have the God-breathed Word. Why don't we hold it up with great honor and cherish this book? This book is God's voice. This is from heaven for you so that you and I can be set free. 
free from all the pain and the anguish and all the things that with confusion in this world, we can be free to worship God the way He calls us and not worship in confusion and ignorance. He gives us the truth. And it's found in this book. Why in the world do we keep it on the shelf and dust it off on Sunday morning? Maybe if I remember to take it to church the 35 days I go. Oh, our life should be built and is, needs to be, if we want to be disciples, built on this truth. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, say it with me, do all giving thanks. That phrase there, in the name of the Lord, is that authority. He's the authority. By His authority. Stop in the name of the law. Well, you know who can say that? Somebody who is a law enforcement officer in that state who's been given the authority to bark out the command, and when they say that command, guess what you need to do? Stop. Based upon whose authority? The law enforcement officers? No. Based upon the authority given to him through the state. It's the state's authority that you stop. He's been made an officer of that law, and he's crying it out to you. Based upon my authority given by them, I tell you what to do. Jesus Christ has told us what to do through this book, the Bible, and what he wants us to do in everything we do in word and deed. Everything we say, everything we act upon needs to be done based upon his authority, not ours. I want to live a Jesus-authorized life. That's what a disciple does. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he was saying to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my... Which means that he must have revealed his word in a way that we can know his word and choose whether to be ashamed of it or not. Ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I truly believe that living a life that confesses to be and professes to be a Christian, but lives a life in ignorance of God's truth, applied in the context of his truth, is somebody who is also living in shame. And that Jesus will be ashamed of them for professing and confessing to be followers and believers of him, but not in all you do in word and deed by his authority doing those things. That you, you and I and people in the world do things that we claim are His when in fact they go against who He is. Now I also understand that being a disciple of Jesus takes time. It's a training session. If I had that tape, that yellow tape, you know, under construction tape, I'd wrap it all over me right now because I'm under construction. I'm nowhere near where God wants me to be. But you know what I want to be? I want to be like my, my Lord and Savior. And so every day I plug along. Every day I want more. Why? Because I had that initial belief and understanding of who He is and I believe He's my Lord. I know He's my King. I know He lives. I know He set me free. I know the tomb is empty. I know that this is His Word. I know I can trust what He says. I know I'm part of the right household and family. I know I'm filled with His Spirit. And because I know these things to be true, I yearn and desire and have the heart to want to press on even when I fall back. And being a disciple is this journey where you want to be like your Savior. And when you trip and fall, reach out for His hand and He'll lift you up. He'll dust you off. And he'll lead you on to the next step of life. Folks, I heard a lot of people say this morning that they wanted to be disciples. It begins by knowing truth, not just saying truth. Saying that you know truth. It's the journey of finding out what truth is and build your life on it. 
And in Ephesians 4, disciples live by truth. And Matthew chapter 28, guess what disciples make then? Disciples make other disciples. That this is the cycle, the life cycle, that our job on this earth as a disciple is that we want people to go to heaven. And to get to heaven, you have to have a relationship with Jesus based upon what? Truth. And so disciples not only live by truth, but they then seek others to be saved too. That's the purpose of life. The life of a disciple. All right. Thank you for hanging in there with me. And I hope we can do a slowed down version somewhere along the line where we can fill in even more thought about this. This is a journey, you know. But I'd love it if the Sunset Church were a people of just living by truth. If you have an issue or a struggle, we have such a neat atmosphere here at Sunset. I mean, more folks come forward every week than I can just imagine. i got brothers who are preaching all over the place, and they've been at that congregation for 15 years, and they, they say, well, we had somebody come forward about 12 years ago. That was pretty good. We had the type of congregation that we're, we're really getting this transparency, and we're, we're trusting each other with our stuff. As Chris Kinsey says, why you won't give me my business? Doesn't that sound like Chris Kinsey? Why you won't get in my business? He talks that high. He doesn't know it, but he does when he gets all fired up. <laughs> the reason is, is because if we are allowed to get in your business, we'll help you with your business. We love you. So if you're having an issue, a problem, a need, please come forward. If you want to give your life to Christ because you've been studying out the truth recently, and you know that you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Spirit, please come forward as we stand and sing.